I just want to invite you to, as we sing these songs, just be comfortable. Relax, enjoy yourself. If you want to sing along, if you just want to read the songs, if you just want to listen, that's totally cool. But we're going to start things off with a couple songs. So why don't you stand up as we start these songs together? And pulled me out 
If that didn't at least get your heart rate going a little bit more, maybe <laughs> want to check your pulse. Just saying. You guys may have a seat. You know, um, we are doing something special today. We haven't done in a long time. In fact, I think in this room since before the pandemic, we haven't done this. But we have a baptism today. This is a special day. And um, baptism, let me explain. If you don't know what baptism is, baptism is, is it's really a symbol is something that Jesus uh, asked for in Scripture. In fact, he asked his cousin John the Baptist to baptize him. And basically, when, when someone is baptized, what they're doing is they're identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So when someone is baptized, as they go down under the water, it's like they're identifying with the death and burial of Jesus. And when they come back up out of the water, it represents that new life resurrection that Jesus demonstrated when he rose from the, the grave. So every time someone is baptized, it's just a reminder of that. And when someone is getting baptized, there's nothing special or mystical about it. It's just a symbol. It's a tradition. One of the few traditions that we have that we, we've passed on from generation to generation for thousands of years, a couple thousand years, but really, it's a symbol. I, I tell the kids that actually were getting baptized, I say, it's kind of like my wedding ring. Anybody knows me, that the woman who was standing here, that hot lady, that's my wife. She's mine. Now, I'm married, but not because of this ring. If I take this off, I'm still married. But other people who don't know me may not know that I'm married. So that wedding ring shows everyone else that I've been taken. This is, I'm married to my wife. That's what baptism really is. It's kind of like the wedding ring of the Christian life that when they're baptized, it's not doing anything for them except for they're saying, I'm proud of the fact that I'm a follower of Jesus and I want everyone to know about it. So that's what they're going to be doing today. And we have eight getting baptized today, which is really cool. So let me put my guitar down here. We have seven elementary kids and one student getting baptized today. And so one by one, they're going to come out here and they're going to get in this really nice, warm. This is not, we should have made it like, we, should we put ice in here, guys? What do you think? Ice? They have spoken. <laughs> but this is a nice, warm tub. But anyways, they're going to climb in here and, and I'm just going to ask each one of them as they come in, have you made a decision to follow Jesus? To, to let you know they've already made the decision before they step in this tub. And at, at based on that profession, that they're saying, yes, I, follow, I want to follow Jesus with my life, then I will baptize them. So I'm going to go ahead and call out the first person. This is JP, otherwise known as Speaker. Come on out here. Watch your step climbing, and yep, you can climb over the edge. In, my clothes? in your clothes. I know, isn't this crazy? You're going in with you're going with everything on. There you go. Yo, is it nice though, right? I want, I want ice in this. Okay. All right, and I'm gonna have you turn around. Oh, it's nice, it's comfortable, trust me. Turn around and face them. And then, then you can sit down. I know, in your, your clothes. It's crazy. You guys got that? You're gonna sit down in your clothes. Do we get ice in this thing? No, you're not gonna get he's ice. Are you gonna put ice in here? No, no. No ice. And go ahead and go ahead and put your legs out in front of you there. You can sit down on your on your butt there. All the way. You gotta get your legs out in front of you here though, because you don't want me to bend your legs all the way back, trust me. 
It won't be cool. So put, put your feet out here. Here you go. I'm going to scoot you over just a little bit. Come on, right over here so I can reach you. And we're going to scoot you up here like that so we don't smack your head. There we go. Okay. You didn't know you had to like go take a class to know how to do this right, huh? So uh, uh, JP Speaker and I are friends, and uh, we've had conversations about this, but I've been excited. He's been ready to get baptized for several months now, and he's been waiting for, looking forward to this day. So JP, I'm going to just ask you one question. Have you made a decision to follow Jesus? Yeah. You have? That's awesome. So based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And what I'm going to have you do is put one, one hand right here on me, one right here, and one, give me your other one. We, we're not going to let you drown. Trust me. Okay, here we go. Ready? Here we go. Buried in his death. Raised in his resurrection. <laughs> Woo! Let me help you up there, buddy. Let me help you up. You got it? All right. And who's taking a picture? There we go. Here's a picture. We're going we're gonna to aim right over there, and she's going to take a picture. That's awesome. All right, buddy. Good job. Watch your step getting out. Yes. And now it's going to get a little cold. Watch your step down the stairs there. All right. And who do we have that's next? John. Come on out, John. Oh, you're ready for this. You were born for this one. He's been looking for his opportunity. You're, you look like you're ready to have a little bit of fun in there. Okay. Should I go away and come back? All right. John, I've, I've known you your entire life. Oh, really? I've known your parents since way before you were born, and it's been fun to watch you grow up and see how you've, you've started moving your life towards God and, and want to live for him. So I'll ask you the same question I asked JP. Have you made a decision to follow Jesus? Yes. All right. Come on closer to me. I, it's fun over there, but let's get up to the shallow end over here. All right. And I aim our feet over here a little bit and kind of bend your knees. Uh, nope, nope. There you go. Right? right? There you go. And you can bend your knees if you need more space there. All right. We're ready. Here we go. You ready? Put your arm here. This, this one like that. I know it's complicated, isn't it? <laughs> this one down here like that. And hang on tight. Here we go. Based on your profession of faith, I baptize you, John, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried in his death. Raised in his resurrection. All right, hold on, John. Let's come over here and get a picture. Oh, you can stand up. Here we go. That's, uh, oh, did we get it? All right, we're good. Okay, you can step out nice and easy. Careful. There you go. All right. And then next, it looks like I've got your sister, Michaela. Michaela, why don't you come on out here? Go ahead and step on in. It's nice, isn't it? I can, that's what I'm saying. Have, go ahead and have a seat. And you can <laughs> aim your legs over this way. Get your feet out in front of you there. There you go. I'm going to pull you back just about right there. All right, there we go. Okay. Michaela, have you made a decision to follow Jesus? Yes. Yes, you have. We've talked about that, haven't we? Well, best on, based on your profession of faith, Michaela, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Put your arms right here and here. Yeah, you got that pretty good. All right. Buried in his death. Raised in his resurrection. Let's take a picture before you get out. That's awesome. Careful. Watch your step coming out because it is a little bit slippery there. You got that? There we go. All right. Who do we have next? Oh, it looks like we got Shelby. Shelby, come on down. Go ahead and step on in. Shelby is the oldest one getting baptized today. Isn't that right? Yep. How old are you? Eleven. Eleven. She's, she's our one student getting baptized today. Who are the students at? You guys representing out there? All right, cool. One of your own getting baptized. That's awesome. Go ahead and get your feet out in front of you here. And Shelby, it's been fun watching you too over the years and seeing how you've grown and matured in your faith. And I'm excited about what the future holds for you. Have you made a decision to follow Jesus? Yeah. Awesome. Well, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you, Shelby, in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and the Holy Spirit. Put your arms over here, one on either side. There you go. All right, here we go. Buried in his death, raised in his resurrection. All right, we're going to get a picture right here. There you go. All right. By the time we're done, I think I'm going to be about as wet as the kids coming out of the water. Just saying. All right, and this is Shelby's younger sister, Holly. Not bad, is it? All right, not bad at all. All right, I'm going to have you get your feet out in front of you here so we got some space. Holly, why don't we spin you around just a little bit and face that way. There you go. Perfect. All right. Holly, have you made a decision to follow Jesus? That's awesome. I'm excited for you, again, like your sister, to see what, what is, lies in store ahead of for your life. you got a whole life ahead of you, don't you? And you got some big plans, don't you, I bet? That's awesome. Well, Holly, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Perfect. Buried in his death. Raised in his resurrection. Oh, oh hold on just a second. We're going to get a picture. Right over there. There you go. Watch your step getting out. All right, next. Looks like we got Avea. Is that Avea back there? All right, Avea, come on out. Avea, it's exciting, isn't it? You didn't want to do a cannonball, I hope, going in here. Let's not do that. Don't, no cannonballs. Note to self. Um, Avea has also been ready to get baptized for, for a few months now. She's been excited and waiting for this opportunity. I know it's been, it's been some, hard to look up to this for so long, huh? Yes. Yes, but, but you have made a decision to follow Jesus. Is that correct? That's awesome. I'm going to have you get your feet out in front of you there. And based on your profession of faith, Avea, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Put your arms right here. One right here and one right there. Oops, I'm back. There we go. All right. Hold on tight. Here we go. Buried in his death. Raised in his resurrection. All right. Let's get you back up. And we're going to take a quick picture here. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think she's got a future on stage. What do you think? Yes. All right. And this is Shelby. This is Avea's younger sister. Oh. Shelby, come on in. Oh my gosh, this is so warm. It is warm, isn't it? It's nice. It's like a nice it's bathtub. So yeah, it's pretty good. Now, uh, uh, Avea and Shelby, are the, the, there's three pairs of siblings today. And so this is the last pair today. It's exciting to see family get baptized together. You're, you're getting ready to have some fun in there, I can tell. We better move on to this before you start diving. All right. Well, we had a conversation on the phone this week, didn't we? And what, what, what did you do this week on the phone? Do you remember the prayer we said? Yeah. That's awesome. You made a decision to follow Jesus, didn't you? Mm -hmm. That's so exciting. Well, I'm excited to, to baptize you today. And why don't we get you over here, put your feet that direction. <laughs> There, it's so much fun. It's tempting not to just float around in here. But, all right, there you go. Based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, you told me to plug your nose really good, right? I'm going to do my best, okay? Here we go. Here we go. Buried in his death, raised in his resurrection. <laughs> oh. She wants one of these at home. All right, hold on. Before you get out, we're going to get a, a quick picture with, with uh, the two of us together here. Oh, my goodness. It's so heavy with all that water. It's awesome. Watch your step getting down there. Nice and easy. There we go. And if, if I do my math correct, we have one more. And that is Nora. Come on in, Nora. How are you doing today? Good. That's awesome. I'm excited for you. We also had a moment last week where we prayed a prayer together, didn't we? Yes. 
That's awesome. So you've made a decision to follow Jesus, haven't you? Yes. That's exciting. I'm so looking forward to what's in store for your life. But based, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you, Nora, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Why don't we get your arms on here? Perfect. All right. Buried in his death. Raised in his resurrection. That's awesome. Let's take a picture with Miss Sandy right here. That's awesome. Give these guys one more hand. <sighs> Isn't it fun to, to be a part of that, to watch this happen? This is the next generation, my friends, that are, that are on their way up. These guys here are going to be the, the next generation world changers. And so I'm looking forward to what's in store for them. And it's exciting to be a, a part of this very pivotal and, and important moment in their life. If you see them roaming around after church today, make sure you congratulate them. Maybe give them a high five today, but I'm excited to see what the future holds of them. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off now to Jessica, and she's going to tell you what's up. Hey, friends. How's it going? Hey, I like your energy. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jessica, and thank you so much for being here today. And I just want to say a big shout out. Congratulations to all the kids that got baptized today. That's such a big, beautiful step for them to take, and I'm looking forward to seeing what they have in the future in store for them. Um, if this is your first time here, thanks for joining us. Uh, we have a free gift for you. It's a book called How Good is Good Enough. It's located on the table on the way out, so you can pick that up as you're exiting. Um, but it's a quick read. I really recommend it. And if everybody looks in their programs, there's the orange connection card. Let me see them. Everybody show me. OK, there's a few of you. Thank you. <laughs> We got a few things coming up, so don't forget to fill those out. First things first is the student corn maze. That's coming up on the 28th of this month. It's 6.30 to 10.30 p.m. Um, they'll meet here at Epic, have some pizza first, and then head out to the corn maze and have some fun there. Um, let's see here. Make sure to bring a flashlight to dress uh, for the weather and uh, maybe even for some mud. I know that's a little hard to believe right now with the 80-degree weather, but it's always better to be prepared than not prepared. <laughs> um, secondly, we have the costume party. That's coming up on the 30th here at Epic. Kids get to dress up, but guess what? The adults do too. I was an inflatable dinosaur last year. <laughs> hey, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um We'll see if I'm going to be the inflatable dinosaur or if my husband will be this year. We'll see. Uh, he's hiding. <laughs> um, that's going to be actually a really fun day for the kids to dress up. There's going to be some prizes and games in their kids' classes and some fun treats for the church. Um, so participate if you'd like. Uh, lastly, we have cans for kids. Um, our Kids are going to be doing a little bit of a competition collecting recycled cans and bottles. Um, this is helping to fundraise for some gift cards for the holidays for some foster teens. If you yourself have some cans that you would like to contribute, I know I do, and I will be bringing them. Um, but that helps the kids support even more foster teens during the holiday season. So be sure to bring those. Now... The time has come, so everybody pull out your notes because we got our next part of our Change Your World Series 2.0. Here it is. Man, I am excited, guys, as we're in now part three of Change Your World already. How many of you guys have been a part of the journey since we started? Like, you've been here both weeks so far. So a bunch of you about half you. How many of you guys, this is your first Sunday for Change Your World? 
All right, that's awesome. We are, we are talking about the fact that we believe that there's, there's change that needs to happen in the world. No one seems to have a problem saying, yes, we need to change the world. But I think a lot of us can, can get overwhelmed by the, 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 how big the task is to think there's almost 8 billion people on the planet. How in the world are we going to change the world? So this series is a journey. It's an eight-week journey to help us understand how anyone anywhere can make a difference, that we have the opportunity and the power to change the world. And so we're walking us through this guide for this, this eight weeks. We're walking through this guide of how we can change the world together. If you haven't got to be on either one or two, I encourage you to go to YouTube and check them out so you can kind of be brought up to speed. But we, we talked the first week about hope. We talked about hope being the reason to change the world. And if we want to change the world, it starts with hope. Because if, without hope, there's no way that we could take on this huge task of being able to change the world together. We have the hope of the world. We have Jesus. We have every reason to believe the world can and will change if we follow what he call, calls us to do and live that out in our lives. And then last week we talked about change, changing the world can't happen unless we change. Because if we're going to stay the same, how in the world is the world going to change? It starts with us. We have to be the ones to make a change in our lives. And we said last week, eight out of ten people do not like change. If you might be one of those people, like, yeah, that's me right here. My wife was just saying this morning about something we were changing up on stage this week. She's like, I'm one of those eight to ten people who doesn't like change. It's hard to change when you kind of get into your rhythms and your groove and what's comfortable to you. It's hard to change things, but you have to. And then we talked last week about how if you change things, you have to stick with those changes. It's really easy to change for a little bit, but if we keep with our, if our autopilot, our default, is to go back to the way we always were, then we'll go hard for something for a little while, and then after a while we get worn out or demotivated or distracted, and we pull right back to our default. So we have to make the changes, and we have to make a mindset that this is a new way of living. And if we do that, we have to, live, we have to um, live out those choices every single day. That whatever changes we make in our life for good have to continue every day. And we, we, if you remember last week, I've got mine. And we got their, their pin and keychain. Every day I, I put my keys in my pocket and I remember this penny. It reminds me. If you don't know what this is about, go back and watch last week. But we talked about how this penny is a reminder that we got to do it every day. Because every time we miss something, any opportunity missed, it takes away from the opportunity we have to make a greater influence in the world. Today we're going to talk about the fact that if changing the world needs to happen, someone's got to do something about it. It needs to happen, so let's stop talking about it. Let's see some action happen. So today we're talking about somebody do something. The question I have for you today is, are you waiting for change to happen? I know I did for many years. I looked at the way things were going and going, mm, it doesn't feel like we're on a good path. I think things need to change. And so I wait. When's it going to change? Who's going to make the changes? Because I know it needs to happen. And maybe you've been in that place where you're like, I'm just waiting on the world to change. Sounds like a good song. I might write one. We wait for the world to change. And we look for someone, as we've seen throughout history, maybe an iconic figure like Abraham Lincoln, who led America, you know, the, the, the troops in victory, that, and he was the one who, who tilted things so that slavery eventually was ended, and we ended up to where we had a free America. Abraham Lincoln is perhaps the greatest president we've ever had. Maybe we're looking for Mother Teresa, someone who's not in like an official you know, leadership role, but through her life and her very actions, her character, and the way she lived her life day in and day out in Calcutta, India, do being a voice for and, and showing love to those who were not loved and those who had no voice. Everyone in the world, you couldn't, you couldn't ask anybody in the world who, who had any access to what was going on in the world who didn't know the name Mother Teresa. Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. is one of my heroes. He, it's said that he is possibly the greatest leader of the 20th century in the world. He was a guy who was just a pastor he wasn't going to go on this movement. It just, he, it kind of hit him by force and he made a decision, a conscious decision that he was going to lead the civil rights movement. And without any kind of governmental position or any kind of, of, of a platform to stand on as a, a, a little known pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church, he begins developing and working with people to end, uh, end the, the, the inequality between races and he, he brought the civil rights movement about. I've noticed something in the last 10 or 20 years. 
you don't see a whole lot of those figures anymore. Everyone that I mentioned has passed away. And there are people in the world today that are making a difference, but not to the degree where you have somebody world, world known, worldwide known, who is making a big difference where we can all rally behind. And I've been praying for and waiting for years, God, please send us someone because we all know it needs to happen. Change needs to happen. But who are we going to rally behind? I'm looking for someone to rise up. Uh, two years ago, a little over two years ago, a very great man, Argentinian-born Luis Palau, passed away just not too far from here. He lived in Beaverton. And he was kind of like the Billy Graham of Latin America. And he led these amazing crusades that changed and revolutionized Latin America and beyond. In fact, the, his legacy still lives on through the Luis Palau organization here in Beaverton. They just finished out this week a crusade in Egypt in an area that's, that's predominantly not known for Christianity to be, a, to, be, to be there, be present, and saw amazing results. But I remember two years ago, and I didn't know Luis Palau that well, but when he passed away, I grieved because here was one more person who lived their whole life iconically for Jesus and no one is standing in the gap to replace him. It's like this generation of amazing people who have done amazing things, people we would consider to be heroes, are coming and going one at a time. They're dropping off and no one is stepping up to replace them. So I've been waiting for years now for a hero to step in and, and take, take that position. I said this to you a couple weeks ago, but... St. Augustine of Hippo said these words. He said, hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are, and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. You see, it's one thing to be able to see the negatives in life. They may attract our attention and realize, hey, that's not right. That needs to change. But it is only when we see the positive side, the hope side of it, that we realize something has to be done about it. We have to step into action. It doesn't do any good to get angry and say, ain't it, ain't it awful, and do nothing about it. Because hope has two beautiful daughters, not just the anger, but also the courage to step in the gap, to have the hope, to step up, to change the world. We have to, we have to put it into action. And I believe the gap between where we are now and seeing success happen in terms of the world be cha being changed is this. It's the gap between I should and I do. Everyone in this room believes that we should be better people, do better things. But the gap for success to take place that has to be closed is we have to move from I should to I do. The smallest deed is bigger than the greatest intention. I don't know if you've heard this riddle before, but five frogs were sitting on a log, four decided to jump off, how many were left? You guys know the answer? Do the math. Five frogs were on the log, four jumped off, or decided to jump off, how many were left? One is the obvious answer, but if you said one, you would be wrong. Four frogs decided to jump off, but until they actually do the jump, they're still sitting on the log. And a lot of times we've decided things, but we don't do anything about them. Good intentions don't get us anywhere. The vast majority of people don't lead their life. They accept their life. Do you have, ask yourself this, do you have an intentional plan for how you're going to lead your life moving forward? If we're going to change the world, it's going to require a bit of intentionality. Do you have an intentional plan to change your life so that you in turn can change the world? You have to lead your life. There are, there are, I believe, three types of people when it comes to seeing the world change. There's the confused people who wonder what happened. There's the comfortable people who notice that something happened. And then there's the catalyst who say, I made it happen. Which one are you? I hope today we have a whole bunch of people who say, I'm a catalyst person and I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to see the world change because I'm going to step into action and be a part of the change that needs to happen. When it comes to changing our world, the first person transformed is the catalyst. They're the person that's the agent of change. You guys know Marvel, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? You guys, yeah. We're talking about agents. I like, I like superhero stuff. In fact, if you were here before the service started, you might have seen a little bit of, of superhero stuff up on the screen there. I'm talking about we're being agents of change change agents, like we're, we're, we're incognito, slipping in, doing the thing that needs to happen, changing the world one person at a time, and it doesn't matter if people recognize or know that we did it, but we slipped in, we did our job, and then we slipped out. Agents of change, catalysts for change. We're going to look at a story in Scripture today that I believe characterizes what it, what it means to change the world 
what we're going to talk about today in terms of taking action. And so if you have your Bible, open it up to Mark chapter 5. And if you have it on your, your device, a digital version of the Bible, make sure you open that up as well. Because we're going to look at a long passage of Scripture and it's not going to show up on the screen. This is the best way to follow along. I'm going to read, and Mark, by the way, is the second of, of the four Gospels. It's the second book in the New Testament of your, of your Bible. And <clears throat> we're going to start in verse 1. And we're going to read the story about this guy who was demon-possessed and what happened in his life. So if you want to follow along with me, read with me. Verse 1. So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerasenes. Now, before I go any further, if you know anything about uh, the Middle East, around Israel, around Syria, all that area there, you've got the, up top, you've got the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River squiggles down to the Dead Sea. The, the lake that they're talking about is the Sea of Galilee. And you've got the west side, which is the Jewish side, and you've got the east side, which is the, the Gentile or non-Jewish side of the lake. They're going to the east side, the non-Jewish side of the lake. Verse 2, when Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from a cemetery to meet him. He's in the graveyard, comes out to meet him. This man lived among the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, um, even with a chain. Verse 4, whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. This guy was seriously possessed. Verse 5, day and night he wandered around the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. This guy was tormented. He was in bad shape. No one could chain him up. They tried, but they couldn't. He could break through the chains. And he ran around cutting himself, torturing himself, because he was tortured by these demons. He was demon-possessed. Verse 6, when Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, this is the demon speaking, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? He knows who, who God is, right? And then, right there in the get-go. In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. This is the demon speaking. Verse 8, for Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Verse 9, then Jesus demanded, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. Verse 10, the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirit begged. The spirits begged, let us enter them. And in verse seven, or 13, rather, Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. I'm going to pause there for a second. There's a whole lot going on in the story we don't have time to dive into, but here's this man being tormented. He's possessed. Jesus meets him. The demons instantly recognize him as the Son of God. He casts them out, but he allows them to go into this herd of pigs, which then they run off the steep embankment into the water, that, to the lake below. In verse 14, it shows this. The herdsmen, the ones who were, who were herding the pigs, fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. This is a crazy part. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. They all knew this guy. He was famous for his craziness. He was sitting there fully clothed because he was a streaker. He had run around naked in the graveyard, fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Verse 16, Then those who had, been, uh, who had seen what had happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. And get this, the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away, and leave them alone. I'm puzzled by that. Jesus did something crazy. This guy had been possessed by a demon. Everyone knew about this guy and what was going on in his life. Jesus heals him. He casts the demons out. These guys testify to it. Yeah, we saw him do that. And instead of the people going, that's really cool, tell us more. They're like, get out of here. Please leave us. We beg you, leave us alone. Go away. It's kind of a crazy response if you ask me. And then lastly, in verse 18, I want to read, and then we're going to, we're going to dive into our notes. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed, or demon-possessed, begged to go with him. So this guy is grateful for what Jesus has done. He wants a little more of that action. So he's like, Jesus, can I come with you? And uh, that's where we leave off in the story. I want to share with you, now that we know this backstory, I think three, uh, three tips that you can take if you want to be someone who steps out and be, become a catalyst, a world-changing catalyst. Here in your notes, the first one is this. Start where you are. First thing you need to do is start where you're at. I want to change the world, but it seems overwhelming. 
I know I need to change myself, but wh like, where do I start? Well, start from the beginning. Start where you're at. We make the mistake of overestimating in our lives big events and underestimating the value of small actions taken daily. We, we think that everything in life that's important has to happen in large, huge, like monumental moments. Like this was a monumental moment here moments ago with the kids, that monumental moment. But guess what? There were really small, subtle moments that happened in the lives of each one of these kids that led up to that point that were way more important than what we just watched there. We celebrate the big moments. We underestimate the power of the small moments. The time where you were kind to somebody who uh, maybe the, the person in front of you in line was rude to them and you said, you know what, you're doing a great job, keep up the good work. You smile at somebody, open the door for somebody. Maybe you've got your favorite client that you work with and, and you know, they, they call up and they're having a bad day and you stop instead of doing business and say, how can I pray for you? Don't underestimate the small moments because over, over time they are way more important than the monumental big moments in your life. Start where you're at, do the small thing first. Look how Jesus directs this man who he cast the demons out of. We've read all this stuff that wasn't in the notes, but this one is in your notes. It's on the screen. Jesus said, no, go home to your family. The guy said, can I come with you, Jesus? And Jesus says, no, you can't come with me. I want you to stay here. Go home to your family. I want you to start where you're at. This is where you're at. Right here, this is where you're at. Go back to the people that you've been estranged from because you've been running around this graveyard all this time. Go back to your family. Start where you're at. We can make the biggest impact in our lives by starting with those closest to us. You know, the first week of this series, we all got a little handout. It was a starfish. Do you remember that starfish? And we told the story of the starfish. If you don't know that story, you'll have to go back and listen. We said everybody has starfish people in their life. And every time you make a difference in the life of that person, you're changing their world. Start where you're at. So on the back side of your notes today, there's a little worksheet, and we're going to do this for each one of these points. But with the very first point, I want you to go to the section that says, who do you know? And while I'm talking right now, not later, but right now, I want you to write down the names of the people who you know, the ones that are closest to you. Perhaps maybe they're the starfish person that comes to mind in your life, the person that needs me to impact their life right now. It could be someone who lives in your house. It could be a, a relative. Maybe it's a neighbor, a coworker. Maybe it's the person, you know, at the restaurant that waits on you every time you go. you got a relationship with them. Who are the people in your life right now that you have, that you know, that you can make an impact in their life? The second thing you do if you want to be an agent for change is this in your notes. Use what you have. So you keep writing those, those names down. Don't stop writing them until you got a few names down there. But the second thing is use what you have. Start where you are, but use what you have. Don't try to be someone else. Don't try to be like anybody else. Don't try to do things with things that you don't possess that someone else possesses. You be you. Be who God made you to be. Here's the thing you need to understand. If you're going to change the world, and listen to me very, very clearly on this one, everything you need to change the world, you already have. Everything you need to change the world, God has already given you. The question is, are you going to discover that? Are you going to be aware of it? Everything you need, God has already provided. What you have in your hand is, is your weapon for the future to be able to use to be effective in changing the world. Here's what, what Jesus told this guy. He said, go back to your family. But in verse 19, Jesus said this, tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. Start where you are. Go to your family. Go to the people closest to you, the people that you have the opportunity to impact the most. And use what you have. What this man had wasn't much. I mean, he'd been running around a graveyard for years, homeless, clothless. What he had was his story. He had a story. And Jesus said, go back and tell your story. Talk about how merciful God has been in your life and what he has done for you. Go share your story. The question I have for you this morning is, what's your story? What story do you have? Everyone's got a story Everyone's story is unique to them. How can God use your story with those people in your life? Think about this, and you can write this down. What do you have? <clears throat> what resources do you have? Do you have any resources that could be used to change the world? What talent do you have? In the area of talent, has God blessed you with something that's unique that you can use to change the life of others? Your personality. 
Some people's personality is uniquely skilled towards organization and doing things quietly in the background. And other people is like they're very like loud and, and gregarious and, and their, you know, their gift is being in front of people, but they couldn't like organize anything if their life depended on it. What's your personality? How about your time? This one's tough because if I were to put my bet on it, everybody in this room doesn't have any of it. Everyone's using up every bit of time they've got. But your time is a valuable resource. In fact, it's perhaps the most valuable resource you've got. And what time are you allocating intentionally toward changing the world? What opportunities do you have? Do you have a work opportunity? Do you have an opportunity with family or friends to make an impact in their life? Use those opportunities. Don't lose them. Don't let them accidentally pass you by, but be intentional. Recognize the opportunities in front of you and seize them when they're there. What about your passion? What makes your heart race? What, do you get, get, what makes you put a smile on your face? What do you get excited about? What makes you angry when the opposite happens? What are you passionate about? That right there is a resource that you can use to change the world. Because here's the thing, I said this last week, that if you set yourself on fire, people come around from miles around to watch you burn. What is it that you're passionate about? You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all figured out. But if you're passionate about it, I, I promise you people will follow you. You will change them. And then what, lastly is, what are your experiences? What experiences have you gone through in your life? Everyone's life is unique. Even identical twins who live their whole life locked arms side by side have different experiences. We're all unique. And what experiences in your life has God got, given you that you can use, either good or bad, to change the world? Because we all have them and God will not waste any of them. I believe that, that sharing our personal testimony, our story, in the church is a lost art. We don't share it anymore. We shy away from it. We're kind of embarrassed of it or we feel like maybe that's just infringing on people to share our story. But might I encourage you today, if you consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus, to be bold, be passionate about what God has done in your life. If he's done something good in your life, be passionate about that. I believe it, and I'll keep saying it over and over. I believe that, the, that Jesus, the power of the gospel, has the power to transform lives. If you truly believe that, it should get you excited. And when it's time, share your story. And your, your story doesn't have to be polished. Your story doesn't have to have like all these ups and downs and twists. It's just your story. Share what God is doing in your life. The struggles, the hurts, the pains, the victories, the sacrifices, the blessings. Share your story so people can see the journey that you've been on and what God will do through their life like he's done in their life. The greatest resource available today, I believe, to change the world is your story. Here's the third thing. First, we start where we are. Second, we use what we have. The third thing is we need to focus on what we can do. Focus on what you uniquely are fitted to do. Don't focus on the things you can't do. I, I think it's interesting. We spend a whole lot of time as people looking at other people's lives going, oh, I wish I could do that. Oh, I wish I had a house like that. Oh, if I had that, you know what I could do with that? Man, if only I was more outgoing like them. And we focus on all the things that we are not good at or all the things that we do not possess. Wouldn't it be kind of peculiar if a giraffe was always like loathing the fact that it couldn't climb a tree or swim. Have you seen that neck? That long neck, that's unique neck that allows it to get up where other animals can't get and that, that really freakishly long tongue that comes out like a snake and like grabs things. How cool is that? So instead of like complaining about the fact you can't swim or, or, or climb a tree, celebrate what you can do. Or a kangaroo. What if a kangaroo would wish it could swim and breathe underwater like a fish, but it can't do that? And it can't burrow underground like a groundhog. Wouldn't that be ridiculous? Have you seen the feet on a kangaroo? That said that a kangaroo easily can leap in one stride 25 feet. That's like from he, me to the drape over there in one leap. And don't get on their bad side and get too close to them because they can also put, you know, get back on their tail and do a nice little kickbox on you and knock you flat. And what about that little pouch? like a little home built in for the young. How many moms, which you, you kind of had that pouch you, could, you can like put your baby into, right? Maybe not, I don't know. But I'm saying the kangaroo should not worry about the fact that it's not a fish. Each one of us are unique. God created us in a unique way. And he wants us to use what he's given us for him and not complain about the thing he didn't make us to be. Because we all fit together like a puzzle. We all are an important part of God's plan to change the world. Look what Jesus uh, said, uh, what happened in the story of this man with Jesus. He says, he sent him off to tell his story, Mark 5, 20. So the man started off to visit the 10 towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. 
This man focused on what he could do. He had a story to tell. He went back to the starting place, his family, and like Jesus said, went back and shared his story and talked about all the amazing things that God had done in his life. So the question I have for you in, in your notes is what can you do? Based on, on who you know, that first little exercise, and what you have, that second exercise, here's the hard part. What is the small action you can take, not next week, not this week, not later today, but when you leave this room? What one action could you take? Small action. It didn't have to. Don't, don't worry about how big and monumental it is. What's one? Maybe you go to, to a restaurant after lunch here and you purpose in your heart that you're going to give the waiter or waitress a really great tip and say, thank you so much for serving our family today. We really appreciate that. Maybe that's it. But what small action can you do today? Maybe it's, it's talking to a family member that has done something great this week and you didn't really recognize it and appreciate them. And you go back and say, I just want to tell you how much you mean to me the difference you're making in my life. And I, I know you've had a rough week, but I want you to know you, you make a difference. I mean, you're a bright spot in my day. Small things. Do it over and over and again, over again. Like that penny in my pocket on my keychain. Keep doing it day in and day out. The power of compounding consistency over time is greater of a force than you can imagine. I talked in the beginning about Abraham Lincoln, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King Jr., there's a lot of other iconic figures I could point out that have done some amazing things in, in our world that have made it a better place. And I asked myself for years, God, when are we going to find another leader like that to step up to change the world? We need a hero that we can all rally behind. But in despair, I've not seen that hero rise up. And there's been times where I've been very saddened to see that. And two years ago, I'm a Harry Potter fan, sorry. If you don't, not into Harry Potter, but I, I love Harry Potter. My family and I watch the, the whole series once every fall. And two years ago, I was watching the third episode, Prisoner of Azkaban. If you know nothing about it, I'm going to geek out for a second. Just that's, that's totally cool. <laughs> and if you plan on seeing it, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the, the punchline of this, this film. But Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry and, and his godfather get themselves in a predicament on the edge of this pond where they've got these things called Dementors, these like evil things that come and literally suck the life out of them. And they're on the, the side and they're losing this battle and they're getting life sucked out of them. And just before Harry passes out, he looks across the pond and he sees what he thinks is his dad who shoots this beam out and saves the day. He passes out and he wakes up in a hospital. Now, because this is fiction, he and his best friend, Hermione, have this opportunity to go back and correct some of the events of the evening, like several hours back, with the help of this device called a time turner. And they go back in time and go through the series of events and it leads back up to this moment. We're on the, the opposite side of this pond, watching again in horror as he's getting his life sucked out and his godfather's life getting sucked out of him. Something interesting happens. I want you to watch. I'm serious. Come on.
was watching that clip. <clears throat> and in this moment, I had an epiphany. And I just started weeping right in the middle of the movie. Because it dawned on me, all this time, all this time, I've been waiting for a hero to step up so we can all rally behind because we all desperately want to see the world change. And then the answer in this, this clip it hit me. The answer is in your bag. And by the way, there's two things in your bag, so let's see how good you follow directions. Pull out just the top thing. Inside that first bag, you'll see a mirror. And I want you to take a good look at yourself in the mirror. Because the hero to changing the world is staring right back at you. All too long, we've been waiting for someone else to step up. And we keep saying, somebody needs to do something. Somebody has to change the world. You're right. That person is you. You're the hero. If you don't step up and do what God has called you to do, no one else will. So take a look at yourself in that mirror and get used to seeing this because you are the hero to this story. I want to read to you the lyrics from Michael Jackson's song, The Man in the Mirror. He says, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. And no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and be the change. Stop waiting for someone else to do it. It's our job. It's our responsibility to step up. In, in Mark chapter 5, last part of verse 20 says this, and everyone was amazed at what he told them. Interesting part about the story, and here's why I tell you guys to bring your Bible to church and read it with me when we're going through Scripture, and why I encourage you to read this on your own, because you pick up on stuff that you otherwise wouldn't find if you didn't read Scripture. And if you read Mark chapter 5 by itself, you hear about a time where Jesus went to the east side of a lake with the Gentile people, and he performed this miraculous sign, the people didn't like it, and they pushed them away and said, get out of here. But if you don't read on, you go on to Mark chapter 7 towards the end, and then in the beginning of Mark chapter 8, you'd miss out on the fact something interesting happens. Jesus goes back to the 10 towns. And this time, they come out and meet him and greet him and welcome him in. And you've heard the story of the feeding of the 5,000 probably before where Jesus is on a hillside and with you know, a few loaves and a, a bread and a couple of fish, he feeds an entire crowd of mob of people. Well, he does another feeding called the feeding of the 4,000. You know where it happens? In that region. And a revival happens and a revolution breaks out for the people on that side of the lake and I believe, Scripture doesn't tell us this in, in explicitly, but I believe, if not largely due, at least partially due to the fact that this man went back, and because he had a reputation in the town, and he shared his story as a man of peace in that community, they trusted him and his story, that when Jesus came back a second time, they were primed and ready to hear the message. Because he did one small thing. He just went back and told what God had done in his life. Do I predict that we will change the world? No. I don't. I'm not a fortune teller. I can't predict the future. But I like what Peter Drucker says. He says, you cannot predict the future, but you can create it. I want to invite some special guests up onto the stage with me here. That this is, this is going to be a treat for us this morning. They're going to bring a couch up here for me. And I want to invite for you guys four kids, world changers. Welcome these guys up here on stage. Now, I know you guys, may have, they may have already got your name when we talked earlier, but I want to see if, if really quickly, I'm going to give, you guys good up here? Yeah, all right. I'm going to give you the microphone and pass it down the line, but just really quickly say your name and your age, and then you can pass it. You can hang on to it when you get it down there on your end, Avea. Here we go. I am John, and I am 11. Mm -hmm. I'm Speaker, and I am 9. I'm Shelby, and I'm 11 and a half. I'm a, I'm a Vea, and I'm nine. All right. Okay. So let me ask you guys this right now. Um, what were you thinking when you were getting baptized today? What, what was the one thought in your head? Hmm? 
And if you want to say something, you ask for the microphone and, and we'll give you the microphone, okay? <laughs> You're speechless. I, I heard a couple comments like, huh, what's that? Let's pass the microphone on down here to John. Um, I could really think I was too hot in there. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Anybody else? Now, you know, I don't think at home that you, your parents can probably keep you quiet and hear you up on stage. Parents, this is the way you do this. This is how you get them to get quiet. Let me, let me ask you another question. Why did you want to get baptized? Um, to show everyone I've accepted Jesus. That's good. I was going to say the same thing. To show everyone I accepted Jesus. All right. And it's okay? The same answer is okay? Me too. Ditto? All right. Um, to show that I was following Jesus' path. That's awesome. Very cool. Now, I'm going to ask you guys, you have, if you had the power as you grow up to do one thing to change the world, to make it a better place, what would it be? To try and get most of the people in the world to believe in God and to try and help the world, like, try and make it a better place and less fight. Fighting. Very cool. Anyone else have an answer? Oh, here we go. Pass the mic down here. Um, believe in Jesus and peace. In peace. I like that. Tell more people about Jesus. Tell more people about Jesus. That's great. Um, go worldwide, man. Tell everyone about Jesus. Literally everyone just... Go to churches, local churches, go there, yeah. see what they're talking about there, tell other people to meet them up, and yeah, whatnot. Now, hold on to the microphone for a second. Now, you, you heard me introduce this as JP, all otherwise known as Speaker, but Speaker and I have a special relationship, and uh, we were talking just this week, and you had a joke that you told me at group on Tuesday night. What's your joke? So, uh, what do you need to make a mic louder? You need a speaker. <laughs> now, I, I need to ask you, speaker, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a cook. A cook? I don't know. There's like two things I want to be, pastor and a cook. So. Pastor and a cook. Maybe you can be both. Maybe, maybe you might even be a future pastor at Epic Life Church. That's pretty cool. You, 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 did you notice how we lit up when, we, when it came to joke time? <laughs> I think you got a future on stage. That's great. Well, I, I brought these guys up here because we just got to see moments ago to, see, to witness this important, impactful moment in their life that really is a representation of life change happening in their lives. And we didn't have room for everybody to be, to be up here, but you remember Shelby has a younger sister named Holly who also was baptized. If we had room for her, what's that? She's right there, and she's right there waving... Holly, Holly, come up here really quick. Come on up here. I'm glad you're here. Why don't you have a seat right here? I want to I ask you a quick question. Back before Easter, we had, we had a, a couple of weeks where we were encouraging people to invite their friends to church for Easter Sunday. Do you remember that? Yep. And you were sitting out there in the service. I watched you, and you were so intent in the whole service to listen and what was going on, taking your notes and all that. And I was told after the service, because we had put three invitations to invite people to church for Easter in the program, and uh, Holly had gone back to the information table and asked somebody for like a stack of invitation cards, and they thought she wanted to draw on them or like do something crazy. And what did you end up doing with those invitations? I invited people from my class um, because I wanted them to experience what it's like to be loved by God. She took those cards and she invited her entire class to church. And there was a, one of her friends and her mom came on Easter Sunday because of that. Guys, it doesn't take rocket science. It doesn't take huge, giant things. It takes small, 
moves of faith, boldness, and courage to do something for God that changes the world. These guys right here, you're going to hear and see more from these guys because these guys are on the move, and they are world changers. And in a, in a while, we're going to have to work hard to keep up with them. And you guys see their shirts that they've got on there? I have decided that, and he's got his on too underneath his sweatshirt, probably a little cold after getting wet. But I have decided these guys made a decision that they are, they are sold out for God. They want to live for him, and they want to do everything in their, in their power to be able to change the world for him. These guys are awesome, so give them a hand, would you? Thank you. I'll take that back. You guys, I need a high five as you, as you walk off the stage, but thank you so much for coming up here. I really appreciate it. Go out there and change the world. Oh, oh, one more. Get it hard. Mm, Got to make it sting. All right. I, I think that there's, there's a different kinds of people who would call themselves a pessimist who see the glass half empty and people who are an optimist who see the glass half full. But both of them don't really see reality as it is. The people who are pessimists, they, they take these circumstances and events and make them worse than they really are. And an optimist kind of doesn't see the obstacles and just kind of like, everything's great. But what I think the third option is for this that I, that I would like to consider myself to be is a possibilist. A possibilist is someone who believes the possibilities for the future. And here's four characteristics of a possibilist. Maybe you're one too. You think progress is possible, but not easy. The road ahead is going to be a difficult one. You see things as they are, but you're not discouraged because you have hope. You know what can happen. You know the potential. You're unwilling to look away from the problems around you. You see problems and you can't shake them off. You, you realize it's your job. You have to do something to fix it. And you're willing to be a catalyst to change the world. If any one or more of those are you, you might just be a possibilist as well. And I believe that God's going to use this to change the world. But you might be sitting there thinking, okay, that's really great to have these kids to come up here. You know, they did a, did a fun thing. That was cute and all that. And yeah, we looked in the mirror. That was really awesome. But I'm not quite sure I'm convinced that I'm the hero that's supposed to step up and change the world. Well, that's where reaching into your bag is going to come into play for the second one here because you need a little bit of convincing. So once you find this second thing in your bag, I want you to put it on. When I, when I watch movies about superheroes, when there's a story, they're introducing a new superhero who maybe was what would be considered an ordinary person, and then they maybe are somehow given extraordinary capabilities, a lot of times what they do in the beginning is they say, no, that's not me. Pick somebody else. I don't want the power. I don't want the attention. I'm not getting involved. But this interesting thing happens, you know, like when Superman goes in the phone booth and puts on his little you know, suit and cape, Spider-Man or Zorro, you know, these guys, they put on their special mask, their hero, superhero disguise. All of a sudden, it changes them. And maybe putting this on, maybe it changes you. I'm going to do something. I want to, I want to, I'll actually, I want to take a selfie with everybody. So get your mask on. Play along here. We're going to take a selfie because, I, and, and I want you also to take a look at yourself in the mirror. Oh, yeah, there is a superhero there. I can see that now. All right. So everybody look up with me. Here we go. I can't get all of you in one shot. We'll do sections here. So this is the middle section. All right, and then we're going to go to the, this side section here. All right, you guys look so goofy. There we go. All right. But take a look at yourself in the mirror and remember that you are a superhero. You have to be willing to put on your superpowers. And, and I'm going to talk to you in a moment about what your superpower is, but here's the thing. Most of you guys are not going to go out this week, and put on this mask and go, ha, 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 you know. You might, might be a little crazy if you do that. But what you do have, what you do have is this. These bracelets, we handed out this, the first week of the series. If you didn't get one, you can find them on the information table on your way out. This little bracelet has the imprint that says, change your world on it. And every day when you put this on, it's like putting on that superhero mask. I want you to remember when you put this bracelet on, and when you look in that mirror, maybe you're looking in the mirror in the morning to get ready. You look at that person in the mirror and say, you're a hero. And today you're going to make a difference for somebody. If you be true to yourself, who you are, who God made you to be, and you take what God has given you, not someone else, but what he's given you, and you go out there and live with passion and with confidence who God made you to be, it gives you this superpower, this superpower in your life, moral authority. 
when you live your life with an exemplary character and with integrity, and you go out there and consistently live it with confidence day in and day out with the people around you, and you do stuff that is maybe not ordinary or not expected, and maybe feel, makes you feel a little bit shy or exposed because no one else is doing it, but it's the right thing to do, you gain moral authority in the lives of people. And in the beginning, on the front end, people kind of look at you and go, you're kind of weird, you're a little bit strange. But if you keep doing it consistently, day in and day out, people will not be able to resist following whatever it is that you're doing because they are, they're admiring the trait in your life. It is a superhero strength that you can put to play in your life every day of your life. Here's what I want you to do as we wrap up today. I want you to check your excuses at the door when you leave today. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm not wealthy enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not witty enough. I'm not. You fill in the blank. What is the thing that you would use as your excuse? I'm too busy. And check it at the door. Because I believe this with all my heart, that excuses are like armpits. We all have them and they stink. And here's the thing you need to understand. This is the danger. The most dangerous excuse you can have is a good one. One that you'll believe because you will follow through with it if you believe that excuse. Throw the excuses out and do what you know you're supposed to do regardless of what it means. Step out, take the risk, and God will use you in a big way. In your notes, that when this is on your memory verse card as well, this is our verse to remember this week. I want to read to you 2 Corinthians 5.20. It says, So we are Christ's ambassadors. We are his representatives. God is making his appeal through us to change the world. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. See, we're called to be Christ's ambassadors. He's represented as much like that demon-possessed man when he was healed and Jesus said, no, don't come with me. Go back to your town and tell them what God has done in your life. You be my ambassador. You represent me. We have that opportunity in our context, in our daily life every week. Today, you have that opportunity. Check your excuses at the door. You know, if you read the book that, that we gave out, and by the way, if there's copies on either side of me down here. If you haven't gotten a copy of the book, Change Your World, that we're going along with, we're now entering week three, if you want to read chapter three of that book this week. And if you read that book, you'll hear lots of stories of, of change that's happening in the world. The, the Maxwell organization is making a huge impact. You may not even be hearing about it in the world today, in the education system and also in world governments around the world. They're being asked now. They've gone in about five different countries right now where they've gone from the top leadership up to the, the prime minister or the president of a nation all the way down through the, the top leadership of the sectors of influence in that nation. And they're working on values to change, to transform these nations. There's over 20 of them still on the waiting list to get into them. But one of the, one of the countries they went into a few years ago was Paraguay. And I want you, as we wrap up today, just to give you a little bit of inspiration, this could be you. I want you to watch Gabby's story. I love people, and I love my people. For me, the Paraguayans mean a lot. And when I see that uh, woman in the street trying to do something to, to survive, and when you're in a situation, a better situation, you start asking yourself, what can I do, you know, to, to help them, to advantage them, and to maybe show them that there is a better way. I went to Guatemala, and what I saw there, and what I lived there just changed my whole life. And I came back uh, to my country sure that it was going to happen here. I was talking to John about it, and when I think about that moment in the States, and I have the picture right now in my mind, in front of John Maxwell with my passport, and he, John giving me the word transformation. And today I look at that, and he's here in Paraguay doing a transformational movement, a national transformational movement. That, that says a lot. So we just this week have brought 250 of our leadership trainers. They will be spending time teaching these facilitators how to have a round table. And by Thursday, we'll have 15,000 of them trained. Those 15,000, the very next week, will begin to train five to seven to eight. So you can quickly see that within about 10 to 12 weeks, approximately 70 to 75,000 Paraguayans will be trained in having leadership values. We want to serve the Paraguayans. 
were here to invest in them, to train them, to give them the tools, and to say, hey, now you go and do it. Just do it. You can be great, and you can have an awesome life, a life of significance. That's the life you want to live. And I know with John Maxwell and the team and the coaches, we're going to accomplish that. Wouldn't it be wonderful if history would report that you, you became the catalyst for transformation in your country? When I am working with Transformation Paraguay, I think a lot about my kids because this is what I'm building for them. I want them to have a better country, a better Paraguay than the one that I have. For the people that have the same dream and that also want to transform their country, they just need to do it. They just need to believe. I'm so excited that I would be able to be a part of something like this. I'm so excited that we have people like Tim and Gabby who decide to make a difference in their country. Didn't make sense. Had no insiders helping her. Couldn't have explained it if you would have asked her. Everything worthwhile is uphill. So Paraguay is going to be a, a model. That's the word. Paraguay is going to be a model for other countries. That's my dream. That's what I believe. We are doing something wonderful. And not only for Paraguay, for more countries. This is just the beginning. And I, I watched that video and there was a line that John in the video said that just struck me. He said, wouldn't it be wonderful if history would report that you became the catalyst for transformation in your country. That's what I want for us. That one day history will report that we were the, the world changing catalyst that stepped forward in our community, that changed our city, that changed our state, that changed our region, that changed the nation and eventually changed the world. Wouldn't that be amazing? You watch Gabby's story. She, you don't hear this on there, but she actually met John and said, I'm going to have you come to my country and change the world. And he says, well, we won't do it unless you know the president and, and can work out the details. We have to work from the top down. And she goes, we'll do that then. He goes, you know the president? She goes, no, but I'm going to. And she did. Without any inside help, she, as a businesswoman, she made her way in to be able to meet the president and convince him that he needs this guy he's never heard of called John Maxwell to come in and, and conduct leadership values uh, groups within their country. She says her country is going to be a model for other countries. How many Gabbies do we have in the room here today? How many of you are saying in your own heart, I've, I've got this, this burning desire in my heart to do what she did in some small way with the people in my life? I want to give you the weekly challenge this week as we, as we end our time here this morning. Here's the weekly challenge for you. Each week we're doing a challenge and I want you to post about it on social media using the hashtag CYW2022. It's this. What is one bold move you can make this week to change your world? One bold move that you can make this week. And maybe post about the bold move or uh, before you do it, like, hey, I'm going to do this. Or maybe even come back and say, here's what I did. But post about that so we can encourage each other. We can celebrate together and get ideas for how we can each do bold moves in our own lives as well from watching each other. God is looking for courageous change agents who are willing to go on this journey. Will you be one of them? Let's pray. God, this morning, inspire each one of us. Give us a passion in our hearts to be a part of this movement to change the world. We sense that you want to do something with us, God. And yet the task seems so insurmountable and it's, it's a bit intimidating but God, we know that you'll use us if we'll step into the unknown with you. We'd, we'd start with the people that we have in our life. We'd use what you've already given us. And then we would start taking small actions to change the world with the people around us. God, we take ownership 
of changing the world. We're no longer waiting for anybody else to step up. Today, we recognize that we are the hero that you've chosen to represent you. We will step up. We will stand in the gap. We will do what it takes through our small actions every day, and we will change the world. Give us inspiration this week. Help us to know what to do to change the world and, and keep it on our hearts and our minds every day, all day long. What's one thing I can do at this moment in time to change the world? Use us today, God. We thank you for this. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, thank you for that. I know that was a little bit extra long today, but um, there's so much stuff. I just want to make sure we didn't miss out on the opportunity to hear that we have this opportunity to change the world together. And uh, if you haven't done so yet, finish filling out your orange connection card. In a moment, the team's going to come by and they're going to pass a bucket by your row. And then we'll also be at that time, we'll be receiving the offerings. If you have an offering to give, you can get that ready as well. But, <clears throat> excuse me, finish filling out that card. Make sure you at least get your name on there, maybe your email address. But if you want to take a next step today, we have next steps every week because we believe that taking action is the only way we change, the only way we get better. That's why every week on our connection card is next steps, some suggestions, some ideas for how you can take a step forward to make small changes in your life. So I encourage you, if you want to memorize that verse, check the box. If you want to make a decision to follow Jesus today, check that box. If you want to uh, take a, an action, a challenge to step out and make the difference in someone's life, check the box for the next step that matches who you, where you're at and where you want to go this week. And then uh, make sure when, we, when the offering buckets pass by that you get those orange cards in the bucket as they stop by. I'm going to go ahead and call the team forward. Guys, go ahead and step forward. And I'm going to pray as they're coming forward as we prepare to receive the offering. Would you pray with me? God, this morning as we give back a small portion of what you've given us, use our resources, use what we give you today, God, um, to change the world. That these small offerings that we give today, these gestures of just gratitude for what you're doing in our lives, what you've done through us, the blessings you've given us, God, use these offerings as we dispense faith, hope, and love this week in our community and beyond. We thank you for this. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so watch for the bucket as it passes by your row. As they're, as they're passing the bucket, I thought it'd be fitting today to share something with you you guys may not be aware of that happens every week in this space where you're sitting right now. We have this really special group of people who come in every week. Um, a guy by the name of Brad Franklin founded a, an organization called Everybody Athletics. And what they do is they work with special needs kids who have graduated high school, have aged out of high school programs. And what they found is the two things that, that are not available is social activities and physical activities to help those kids continue to develop and grow and nurture them. So he takes high school students, partners them up with a special needs person, and they do aerobics and social activities together every week in this space. And I want you to watch this quick video from Brad. Watch this. EBA's primary mission focuses on the physical and social strengthening of our adults with disabilities, but really I think that the hidden mission is uh, erasing the lines of service provider and service recipient, uh, the lines of athlete and teammate, and uh, how it's just people, just people spending time with one another. Thank you for all that you guys do in this partnership together, uh, for opening up your doors and allowing us to make your space a gym once a week. And for not only that, for your great lobby space, for our parents to come and drop off their adults and just relax and have some respite by themselves. So we really appreciate that and just look forward to a continued partnership together as we serve people with and without disabilities in the community. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted you to see that so you know that if, if, you're, if you're part of a, a regular supporter at Epic Life Church, that you are have a, a part in the lives of those kids that come in every week, those adults actually, that come in every week and have their lives impacted in a small way because we get a chance to dispense faith, hope, and love right here in this space midweek. So thank you guys for that. As we uh, wrap up today, I want to invite you to come back for next week, which is part four of our Change Your World series. Go out this week and do something to make a difference. Don't wait on somebody else. You be the one to lead the way. Go ahead and stand up as you're leaving today. Think about somebody you know who you might invite to come back with you next week who needs to hear this message of hope and bring them with you. Say hi to someone you sat near. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you later.